scrolling mindlessly through memes on Twitter, as one does daily, uh, I came across a rare occurrence of somebody doubting something related to uranium. Okay, that, that somebody was Menachem Sockler, who long-term viewers of the channel will remember as the guy with the interesting ideas, which he really is. The guy thinks a lot about stuff. And uh, last week, he tweeted this. Let me, let me read it. Spud, he says, is just like every other Ponzi in requiring exponentially increasing inflows in order for existing holders to exit with a profit. Wow. Okay. I don't think I have to tell you, but it, it didn't take long for me to reach out to him and ask him to explain himself. Okay. So here's that conversation. So I think it's, uh, it's not a Ponzi scheme. Uh, that takes what I said out of context. Uh, the reason is because a Ponzi scheme really has nothing behind it. It's just a confidence game. Um, and I think that I want, so I want to be clear that I think that the, the holdings of SPUT are very valuable. So it's not a Ponzi scheme. Um, what, what I was saying was that it is like a Ponzi scheme in that in order for the uh, legacy investors to get their money out, um, even not at a profit, but in order for them to get their money out, they need even more money that uh, to come into the fund than has already been, been uh, gone in. Um, and if you think about, um, l let's say that they issued, uh, let's just say they issued $2 billion worth of, worth of shares, right? Um, just to keep the numbers easy. So if you're a, a holder of SPUT, how do you get your money out? You go and you, you know, you hit the bid on, on, or you, you hit sell or you send the limit order to sell your shares. But that means that someone else has to, let's say you own $100 worth of, of shares or you bought $100 worth of shares. Um, someone else has to pay you that $100 worth of shares, right? In order for you to get that money out. Because what SPUT is not going to do, what they've told us they're not going to do is liquidate their holdings. Hmm. So, what that means is if you think of the group that has paid SPUT this $2 billion and SPUT took that, that money, they paid 1% to themselves and then they took the rest of it and bought uranium with it, which they're not going to liquidate. That means that for them to get their money back, even without a profit, um, they need that $2 billion to come in as a bid. And the bigger that SPUT gets, the bigger this problem gets. So, uh, you know, if, if uh, they issue... Let's say, you know, in, in a few years, let's say they issue $5 billion uh, worth of units, right? That means that new, if they want, if those owners want to sell their holdings, then they need $5 billion of new buyers to come in. And that's just to, without a profit, mm -hmm. right? So what happens if, um, you know, the, the, the risk that I see, what happens if the price of uranium goes to, I don't know, let's say, the spot price overshoots to $200 a pound, right? So the nav on spot goes up to whatever. But now if people want to sell their shares, right? They say, okay, I'm going to take profits now. They, it doesn't matter what nav is. It doesn't matter what the spot price is. They need that new incoming capital in order to, to, to exit. It's not possible mm -hmm. to, to get their money out if they don't have an incremental buyer. Um, so it's very much, it's also a confidence game. It's kind of like if I said, you know, I'll sell you a share in my house, right? I'm, I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to move. Uh, you know, and if the, if the shares trade higher, then I'm going to issue more shares in my house. And then, you know, I'll, I'll spend, the house, spend the money from issuing more shares on the house. I'll, I'll build myself an addition. I'll, I'll renovate. I'll buy myself new, whatever. And so, you know, I'll say the, the value of the property is going up because you're paying me to put money in the property, but you're, you don't have a controlling interest. <laughs> you can, you know, if you want to get your shares back, I'm not going to sell my house to, to give you your money back. You, you have to find someone else that wants those shares. That's, that's kind of exactly what, what is happening with SPUT is that it's, um, it's luring people in by telling them that this is the safe way to play the sector, but these people are not thinking about how do, how do, is, how do people get their money back? Hmm. Um, and you can, uh, like one of the arguments, one of the counterpoints that I'm seeing come up is that, okay, that's how, you know, that's how everything is, right? That's how. Yeah, exactly. Unless are. the company's, unless the company's paying dividends or selling its assets, 
if you want to sell it at a profit, you need the greater fool. You need someone to buy it off you at a higher price than what, uh, than what you paid for the company. So you need constant inflow of capital from outside of the existing pool of investors if all of the existing pool of investors are to make a profit on it. So it either means that um, you're confident on the sector attracting capital from the outside, or you're confident that within the pool of investors, you're going to be one of the few who are not going to lose money. Because if no new capital comes in, a portion of the people inside have to lose money for the other portion to make money. That, that's how the, the exploration pick, you know, stories work. The exploration stories that don't really find anything, I guess. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. So if, if a company doesn't have a cash flow and has no future prospect of cash flow, mm -hmm. then what's its value? Its value is nothing because that, that um, you know, the, the cash flow is zero, but you can have a company that has no cash flow that's still valued at something because they have a chance of producing a cash flow in the future. Um, and then that's kind of where the value, the, the value of split is, is this sort of bet that people are taking that, okay, at some point, this fund is going to be wound down. Even though they're telling us that it's not, they're mm -hmm. telling us that this is just a, um, you know, like a permanent confidence game, right? It's just gonna, it, the, the goal of this thing is to, to just accumulate more, more metal. As of, as of right now, they have no redemption mechanism. Uh, they, they are not talking about changing their, the, the uh, fund structure. They're not talking about selling out at some level, at some price level. Um, or selling uranium kind of like, because I guess, I guess if they were to change the structure and start selling the uranium to, to, I don't know, to fuel buyers or to the government for the strategic reserve or whatever, that, that would change the game. You know, that would make them, that would make them a company that buys uranium, holds it and then sells it at a higher price. And that's easier to value. And, and then, then we, you get cash flow and you can start getting dividends, but that's not how the fund exists, right? They're, they're just saying, right. we're right. just going to exactly. buy the uranium. So we're going to like, hold it. Yeah, it's kind of like saying that a Ponzi is not a Ponzi because uh, uh, one day they're going to give us our money back. It's, it's uh, similar to that, right? Um, and I would question, like, if, if let's say something happens and, and shareholders, uh, you know, vote to restructure the fund, what happens when Sput takes this, all of this, you know, billions of dollars worth of uranium that they've accumulated and now has to go to market to liquidate it because the shareholders, what's going to happen to the price of uranium when that hits? Mm. That, again, if you don't have a buyer on the other side of the physical market, then the buyers, you know, you know the, the legacy buyers of SPUT can't get their money up because again, there's no bid. In my, in my opinion, SPUT needs to restructure as soon as possible so that there is a redemption mechanism. So the mm. ATM is great, to have that ATM because then you have that like close tie with the spot price on the upside. Um, you know, where they, as soon as they're trading at a tiny little uh, premium to nav, they can raise money to buy in the spot market. So it's nice to have that, but not having that on the downside is, is a huge problem for investors. And um, right now, I think that it's only working right now because it's a confidence game, because it's like, uh, you know, we say that, we say that this is how much uranium we have and therefore the fund is worth this. And so if you're buying the shares, then you're getting it, you know, let's say you're, you're buying it at a discount to nav because uh, you know, it's, it's like that, that example of buying a share of my house. It, it doesn't benefit you at all. The share, the share does nothing for you. It's just mm. worth something because I said, this is what my house is for. Um, and then another thing is that people are saying, okay, well maybe a sovereign will come and buy them out. Or, you know, once they're, once they're X big, who like who's coming to to buy billions of dollars of uranium at a time? Think about how the size of the of the uranium market as a whole. You know, there's nobody that there's no utility in the world that needs two billion dollars of uranium at a time. You, but so you don't think that right now the way that it is buying shares of spot is necessarily the same as buying physical uranium? Like you don't you don't see right. you, you don't see right. that exactly. as equal to each other, right? Right, they're not equivalent to me. Okay, um, at, at, you know, and yellow cake is they do, uh, you know, they will liquidate their holdings if they're trading at a de uh, deep enough discount. They've done that a few times. Um, you know, we've seen that, and so they're able to close that discount. Um, they they're very slow. They're very clunky. Right, they don't have an ATM. 
Um, they, they have this like purchase agreement with Kazadam from that happens once in a while. And maybe if they're trading at a big premium, then they'll raise some more money, but it, it's a very slow process. It's not like sputs, but it's very, you know, uh, very tightly, tightly connected with the, the spot market because as soon as they have money, they have the choice uh, to, to go in and spend it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, this, we see the same thing on the downside. The, the discount has to be like pretty big and then it has to be sustained for a little while uh, before they, you know, liquid, start to liquidate their holdings. Hmm. Does that mean that you think the outperformance that we've seen in the last year between SPUT and the equities that, at, that, that eventually is going to run out? Like SPUT cannot continue to keep outperforming based on the logic that you told me. Is that, is that true? Has SPUT outperformed? Well, okay. Uh, so this year, right, um, you know, in the sell-off, yeah. then, yeah. then SPUT has. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what happens, you know, what happens if, if the investors lose confidence in SPUT? Could it go right? to zero? And, sure. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm saying, is that if you lose the bid, if you lose the bid because people don't want the, the shares anymore. They don't believe that the shares are worth anything. And then you have these billions of dollars of units that people now hold. If they're all going for the exit, it'll go to zero. You'll have a hundred percent discount to now. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. So what, what does that mean? You don't like, you, you don't hold any spot. You're mostly in I don't the hold companies. Any. Well, that, that would also make, does that also mean that you don't hold any explorers? I don't own explorers either, but that's for a different reason. Um, that's because, so with the way I think about explorers is that uh, they don't have intrinsic value. And the reason is because there's yeah. um, like, even if they have a discovery, it's, it's not the same as a resource. And even if they have a resource, um, there's just so much uncertainty with the value of the resource. And then even if they know the value of the resource, right, it, it's a well-developed project. Um, the time until that cash flow is realized discounted to today makes that whatever that number is very small, right? The normal, you know, discounted cash flow analysis, NPV. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're very, very far in advance of that, that cash flow stream, that makes that cash flow stream worthless uh, or not worthless, but worth very, very little, right? So when I see um, mm -hmm. an explorer that's trading for, let's say 50, $70 million, and then I have a developer that, you know, with the right conditions can go into production in two or three years for, for trading for, let's say like a hundred or, or twice that it doesn't make any sense. The explorer should be a tiny fraction of the, of the cost of the developer that's near, that's near production. But instead what you have is this, um, you know, this speculative aspect that, uh, that drives, you know, like drives an outsized demand for these little companies, these little explorer companies, even though they're, their real, the fundamental value of the company is very, very low. Um, mm. You know, if, if we had explorers like that were trading in the single, single million dollar market caps, that would make more sense to me. Um, you know, like you, you sprinkle a little money here and there, but when they're $50 million, what the heck are people thinking? Like, you, <laughs> I know what they're thinking. Most of us, because that's what I do. <laughs> I'm one of those degenerates. My, my portfolio is very explorer heavy. Most of us are thinking like we have the good geology and we have the good team. They're going to find something and they're going to sell it within this bull run. That's what we're betting on. Because when you sell it, you have an inflow of cash, which is it's a one time event. But that's also when you sort of when you get out, if the company gets sold in full. But at the same time, you, you, have, the, you have a comparable problem as what Split has you have to be able to have a buyer. So you have to know that somebody's going to come in and buy it. It, it. it doesn't suffice to only find the thing. People are also going to have to want to buy it. Now, Sput just doesn't have that rhetoric. Like they, they cannot start selling uranium. Uh, and exploration companies can sell their projects, but they have to find it and they have to have a buyer. And those are two big ifs. That, that, that's the risk of exploration, I guess. Uh, I, I think it's, it's beyond that, um, is that you have a probability of dilution that you mm. have to take into account. Um, and you have the probability of drilling failure. So, yeah. you know, you're, you're spending money on drilling and 
maybe you find something, maybe you don't. Then you have the probability of translating a discovery into a resource. So, um, you know, let's say you you hit some radioactivity. That doesn't mean that it's a viable it's a viable resource, right? If it's you know very chunky and you hit little pieces of high grade here and there, doesn't mean that it's a mineable resource. Mm. Um, you know, it's just it, it increases your probability. Um, and, and then there's the technical aspects, right? What's the, like, what's the, the costs of processing that kind of rock and, uh, the, the, uh, physical PEA, constraints. basically like, are right, you going to exactly. have a good PEA or, a you know, you advance. Right. So there's all of these uncertainties that, you know, all of these uncertainties that decreases, like all taken together dramatically decrease the probability of project success in the long run. So let's say you assume that if this is a successful project, it's worth whatever, I don't know, a billion dollars of, of NPV, but then you're multiplying it by a probability of success that's so small for an individual, you know, for an individual project um, that, you know, what, uh, what's the value there? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, but again, like time frame, you know, let's say, let's say you're, you're going to be generous here. Are, uh, with your with your discount rates, right? What is what's the discount rate that you're going to use for for something? Like you you make an assumption about when that cash flow is going to happen, and then you have to make an assumption about what discount rate you're going to use. Mm-hmm. You know, if these things are financing through, I don't know, uh, 10, 15 percent debt, somewhere somewhere between there, right? Are you going to use a seven percent discount rate? 5% discount rate on a project where it's fine. Either it's financed through dilution or it's financed through 10 to 15% debt. Uh, you know, so I think people tend to kind of twist their, uh, you know, change the inputs of their DCF models so that they look more optimistic than they should. Um, and that's fine. You know, that's, that's, they're free to do that. Um, yeah. uh, but for me, if I want to hold things that have intrinsic value, then I'm cautious with holding things, you know, like that, that are, that are, have those, those compound uncertainties. So that makes you attracted to Africa then I would guess, because they, 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 you know, they, they're much quicker to production oftentimes. Uh, if, even if they, it, you, they could find something this bull run and have it in production by the end of it too. So. Um, yeah. 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 I, I, I prefer the development companies because they have the torque, Right, they're cheap enough that that they have built-in leverage to to the to the uranium price. Um, but they're also, you know, you you look around, they're they're in various stages of of risk and development. Um, and mm. there's there's that, that's pretty much the only place that I see uh, I see companies that really fit my 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 appetite. You know, I want something that has a lot of torque, that has a lot of leverage. That allows me to get uh, plenty of exposure to the cycle without, um, you know, without needing more capital, right? So, mm-hmm. if I could buy, if I could put half as much money on the table by buying a higher torque, uh, higher torque asset, then I'd rather do that.